All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Andy Paul, who happens to also be in San Diego today. How are you doing, Andy? Doing great, John. How about you? Yep, I, I'm doing absolutely fantastic. And uh, and Andy is a multiple author, uh, and he is uh, the host of the podcast uh, Accelerate with Andy Paul. Uh, and he's a multiple author. But what we want to talk about today is this book, the new one, Sell Without Selling Out, A Guide to Success on Your Own Terms. So, um, Andy, let's, let's just get straight into it. Sure. Uh, I mean, number one, tell me just why you felt the need to, to write uh, an, another sales book and and what is different about this right so <clears throat> this really came from yes my work with companies various companies all the conversations i have on my podcast with uh sales leaders and so on is, and looking at just the data that's out there it's, uh, just this this feeling that we're not getting any better <laughs> so, um and in fact yeah, arguably we're we're getting worse at it. So, you know, I was examining the reasons why and and it came up with this idea that or thought is that hey, yes, part of it's because being driven by the fact that we're still relying so heavily on these outdated salesy behaviors that uh, you know stereotype salespeople as being unreliable, sleazy, and pushy, and so on. And in fact, with some of the technologies we brought to bear, that perhaps were using those technologies to amplify the impact of those salesy behaviors in a way that uh, having a negative impact on our ability to earn the trust of our buyers and do business with them. So uh, yeah, the book sort of came out of that. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And I think, I mean, I think a lot of it is that there's so much transition going on. There's so much change out there. And I think there's the perception, and I think this is part of it, there's the perception that there's so much noise, it's so highly competitive out there that perhaps people are adopting tactics or being you know, um, even more aggressive and then using technologies and piling on it. It's just becoming this huge pylon as opposed to something that's strategically well thought out. Yeah, well, I think that's true. And I think that that we don't do sellers any favors in the long run by continuing to sort of emphasize this is the way to act. And when I talk about this on podcasts, on LinkedIn, other places, you know, you just get pushback occasionally from people say, well, this, this doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> in modern B2B selling, this doesn't happen. That's like, oh, really? <laughs> yes, it does. Every day. Yeah, there's somebody that posted something on a comment to one of my LinkedIn posts this morning that said, yeah, I avoid salespeople like the plague. And let me just give you some recent examples of things that happened to me with people outreaching to me. He's a business owner. And they're all examples of what I cite in the book as examples of selling out, right? It's this, this behavior that just has no value for the buyer and thus has no value for you as a seller. And I, I make the point is that you, we could stop these behaviors cold turkey today right just decide look we're not going to do this anymore right. and no one would be worse off for it nobody in sales would be worse off for stopping being salesy yeah. i think though yeah I, I think that's a great point and i think there's a i think there's a nervousness i mean there's a fear that as i said that if you take a more strategic a more thoughtful approach that maybe you're going to be left behind or that maybe it's going to take a little longer maybe you're going to have exactly. less in your pipeline that's all it. of those things yeah that's it i think there's just this element of fear on the part of sales leadership to say yeah the plane's taken off already and making any sort of changes now would be akin to trying to fix the wings while the plane's in flight and in the venture funded world if you're a new CRO with a, you know average tenure less than a year and a half now, you're brought into a job as they're all fearful saying, look, yeah, this is not the way to do it. We need to make some changes. And hey, we're going to have a down quarter or two while we make this happen. It's going to be better in the long run, but just trust me, we are going to suffer for, no one will say that. Yeah, and that's a great point. And it's, it's, um, and, and I could, I've been through this myself back in the day with, sure. some, uh, with some other companies, though, is that when you when you focus on 
your target customer and quality in your pipeline. So you have to your pipeline will go down. Right. Yes. But it means you're taking all the fluff out. And if you've ever been in a situation like I have where you have to explain to the company, to the parent company, why your uh, pipeline is a quarter of what it was last year, but you're more confident in it. Right. Well, <laughs> right. But this is sort of the conundrum we get into is, is you know, let's say in the SaaS world is sort of the gold standard is, oh, you need to have 5x pipeline mm -hmm. coverage, you know, for your current current period. And I tell sales leaders said, well, here's a rule of thumb. Your win rate is the reciprocal of your pipeline coverage requirement. Yep. And so, yeah, you want to have a 20% win rate. Yeah. You're going to five X pipeline coverage and it just works out that way. And I, and I think that if companies are, you know, working with, let's say a 20% win rate, my question to them is, well, can you claim you really have product market fit? If you can only win one of every five of your most qualified opportunities. Yeah, and I think that's a really, I think that's a really important point to emphasize, uh, because yeah, it it's done it's done retrospectively, and it's often done by win rate, as you say. Okay, we need five, X. and instead of starting and asking yourself why is our win rate so low, they'd say, okay, we need right. to pile in more opportunities to offset it. <laughs> right, <laughs> which is the problem. So. That is one of the, also another impetus for writing the book is to say, look, we, we're stuck in this environment where people are just ignoring the importance of your win rate. And I think the way that engineer a process is to start with the desired win rate and then scale from there, right? Get repeatable at the win rate that you want, which, yeah, I'll say is you, you should win at least a majority of your most qualified opportunities. Otherwise, you've got a mismatch either in your product market fit or in your capabilities in the process you've set up. Yeah, and obviously the amount of time then you're investing in in trying to sell to the to the ones that you lose to, right? You know, your, right, which aren't a cost, fit, which right. aren't a fit. So uh, you also say one of your chapters is like, are you a sales leader or merely a sales boss? That seems to tie in nicely with what we're talking about right now. Right, <laughs> it does. Yeah, I mean the book is primarily for individual contributors, though the subtext throughout is obviously for sales leaders. But I did take a moment in the middle book, what I call an intermission, to speak to sales leaders directly. And make the point that if you're so focused on your process and your metrics at the sake of helping your people develop, become the best version of themselves, then you're missing the ball. And there will be companies where this is the exception, but by and large, you have enough experience in this as, as I do, you know, that's what happens. Eventually you're going to crater. You have to give people the agency and the autonomy, the people who work for you, you can give your sellers the autonomy and the agency over the choices they make about how they sell. Right, we have a framework we want people to operate in. That's fine, but within that framework, everybody's going to operate a little bit differently. Everybody has a unique set of strengths, and if we lean so far into the technology to say, "Look, everybody, you know, here's John. He's the best seller. These are this is how he does a call. Be like John." Well, the fact is, nobody can be like John. There's only one John, right? Everybody has to become the best version of themselves, and we need to have managers say, "Yeah, that's my job." much as it's your job as a salesperson to learn, to listen, and to make sure you understand what's most important to your buyers and then help them get that. Managers have to do the same thing with the people who work for them. You have to listen to them, understand what are the most important things for them that they're trying to achieve. If you help them get that, then they're going to be more productive. They're going to be more creative. They're going to be more fulfilled. They're going to stick around and start solving a lot of issues. Yeah, and I, I liked what you said about processes. Like, are you, are you, are you looking at process as a way of making your salespeople more efficient, more productive, help them, or are you building processes to help yourself or help the company and things that are going to inhibit performance? I mean, if if a if a process is pretty good for your sales if you're putting in a process that doesn't help your salespeople in in some way, then it's not a good process. Yeah, yeah, and if it's not able to help the sellers win at a certain rate, then it's not helping the sellers, it's not helping you. Yeah, absolutely. And there's only one, and look at the next chapters here, there's only one question every buyer will ask you. Yes. Well, and this, this question is, why you, right? Is, is this, is, this starts where selling starts, is the buyers have to make a decision, are they gonna invest their time and attention in you? You, the individual, not you, the company, mm -hmm. not you, the product, you, and 
this this is where it all starts. And I, I have this story in the book that you read about early in my career, making yeah. a call on a CEO of a company that I, one of those calls where you go in hoping they're not going to be there, so they won't you won't have to talk to them. <laughs> but unfortunately, he was. <laughs> but it turned out to be this great learning experience where he asked, you know, why should I buy from you? And it was the first time it sort of dawned on me. He wasn't talking about my company. He was talking about me. And I had no freaking idea what to answer at the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, such, it's such an interesting thing, Andy, because that is, if you ask mo most salespeople why I should buy from you, they'll tell you why you should buy from the company, as we just yes. said. And they'll probably be very comfortable with that and have a down path. But then if you say, well, yeah, putting that aside, uh, Andy, why should I buy from you? That will stump nine out of 10. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and the, the point I make in the book is this is not a question that's verbalized, right? The customer doesn't mm -hmm. ask you. It's, yeah, yeah. it's how they experience you. And at the end of the day, we've all seen the, the, the studies and stuff with Challenger and Forrester is that when buyers make their decision, the primary factor they take into account is their experience with you as a seller. Right, because mm -hmm. hey, yeah, there's <laughs> half a million you know, conversational intelligence tools out there these days. How do you distinguish between them? Well, as a buyer, it's really hard to do that because you know the differences in the products are so slight. So when they have to make their decision, what do they come to? Well, they come to well, what was my experience like working with the individual and in the company in make, going through this buying journey, mm -hmm. and that can be I the decisive factor. Yeah, and I think that, and I think the important point there, just to underline for people, is is the word you use there is experience, the buying experience, right? So it's not a transaction, it's not a series of you know, a few phone calls or online demos or whatever it is. It's an uh, it's an experience from the moment they engage with you to the moment to when they become a customer and beyond. Yeah, and I I didn't bring it back into this book, but I wrote about this in my previous book. Is yeah, big believer in study that Daniel Kahneman did that came up with this idea of what he called the peak end rule. And he said that when he has research on people go through an experience and they look back on the experience to make a decision, they remember two things, the peak event in that experience and the last event in that experience. And so as sellers, you can't predict ahead of time which of your interactions with the buyer is going to be considered the peak event by them. In some cases, it could be you respond to a lead in you know, 15 minutes, boom, that's the peak event. That's what they remember all the way to the end. That's why they buy from you. But you don't know ahead of time. So it means every time you interact with the buyer, you have this responsibility to bring your A game. Mm -hmm. And think about I, it. I mean, it's really not that hard. I mean, I, writing a post that we're going to publish shortly, it's like, you know, as a seller, how many moments do you have during a month where you have to be at your best? right? Hit your number. I mean, is that 10 moments, 15 moments? It depends on the deals you're selling and so on, but it's not a lot. Yeah. And I think that's a really important point there. Yeah. It's, it's not a lot. And it's not like you're, you're saying that you have to be on 24 hours a day because no. 24 hours a day, you're not actually, you're not talking to engage. It'd be great if you were, but the chances are you're not. So no, save it's, so it for I, when it matters. Yeah, I mean, so if you graph out a sales cycle, it's just gonna be these peaks, mm -hmm. a series of peaks that slowly build to a decision. Well, in the gaps between the peaks, the buyer has completely forgotten about you. They're going about their own job, doing their own thing. So it's what you do at those peaks that matter. Yeah, because I mean, let's face it, Andy, how often do, do we hear, and the most frustrating thing is when somebody goes quiet, oh, it was great, and now they've gone quiet, and you can't, you know, get in contact with them. As you say, they're not operating on your time. But the other thing is you may not have at that point have created that, that peak experience. Oh yeah. Well, first of all, yeah, it wasn't great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just FYI. And they've made a decision about you and it's personal. What they're saying is and not personal as in you're a bad person, but personal sure. as in you're not worth my time and attention. Yeah, yeah, which is which is a tough one to take. The one, the last thing I'm just going to uh, focus in here on your book is I love this. I love that the, you have a chapter um, dedicated to is is curiosity because 
And the reason I say that is because I think we live in a world today where people have become exceedingly intellectually lazy. Some people are. Mm -hmm. um, we're used to, you know, everything is a bite size, is a social media, is a headline, is a bumper sticker, whatever everything. So intellectual curiosity, I find, is at a premium. And as you say, when you bring, if you have real curiosity in a sales cycle, it, it, it's, it's almost like, you know, your secret weapon. If, you're, if you can mm. be genuinely curious. Right. No, it's absolutely true. It's, is, and buyers can sense that, right? They know the difference between sort of most discovery calls, which I call survey taking, which is I've got my, my pad, I'm checking off answers on a, and somebody that's really curious and wants to go beyond just knowing something to understanding it, right? So discovery for most companies is set up to uncover information, not to understand it. Right? Why, why I know this information, but why is it important to the buyer? Why is it important to, to the individuals in the stakeholder committee that I'm dealing with? We oftentimes don't make that, that gap because we think just knowing it is enough. So it's your curiosity that's going to take you beyond the level of just knowing to understanding. And, and you know, that I talk about in the book, there's this old Disraeli quote, you know, he with the most information wins. You know, I updated that says, no, he with the most understanding wins. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you don't reach understanding unless you're curious enough to go on a journey to understanding. Exactly. Well, and I think that's that sort of differences in between buy, you know, buyers and sellers. We, you know, we've got this process. We go on this discovery, and buyers go on an exploration. <laughs> you know, <it's> just, <laughs> we've got a process. Buyer goes on a journey. It's like, well, how do we end up at the same point if we, you know, have the terms yeah. we use to think describe them are so different. Yeah, and sometimes it's a it sometimes it's a meandering journey too. Yeah, I think it usually is. I mean, <laughs> Gartner had their buyer enablement survey diagram, which you know is this complex flowchart spaghetti diagram of the process of a buying journey. You know, hey, they could be two thirds away the into it, and they learn something new, they go back and start again. But this is not the way most sellers look at because they have their linear stage based processes and. Once we exit one stage, there's no going back. It's like, yeah, that's not the way the world works. Yeah, and and too, one of the points you made earlier about you know the the trust factor and building that trust factor up with the customer, because at least then, if you have built that, if you build some value into it, uh, if they are in, if they are interested in communicating with you, then then they're more likely to actually tell you their process, tell you what they're doing, tell you the interruptions, yeah. we, we tell you the truth if a thing gets stalled. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the thing is that most sellers don't understand. It's just because you ask a buyer a question. You and I could ask a buyer the same question. And if they trust you and don't trust me, you're going to get a different answer than I get. Mm -hmm. And when you build this level of trust with a buyer, what they do, as I talk about in the book, is they give you permission to stick your nose into their business, right? And if you don't have that trust, you don't get to stick your nose into their business. They'll give you the superficial answer. Yeah, that's a that's a great analogy. You have to stick their stick your nose into their business and then just keep sticking it in until they until they yeah, that's right. Just take it out. I've never had a customer <laughs> say, "Hey, Andy, stop, stop. Too many questions. Stop. Too many questions." It's like, no. If you're being sincere yeah. and authentic, and you're really curious, and you're continuing to sort of go down a logical path, they'll yeah. go with you. And particularly if through your questioning, you maybe actually help them see something in a different way, maybe team totally unre unrelated to what even you're selling sometimes. I mean, it's just that they go, hmm, interesting exactly. conversation. Well, listen, Andy, yeah, as well, usual. The point so I was trying to make in the book and the chapter, on, well, the point is just last thing is, the point I was to make in the chapter on curiosity is that, you know, we always talk about delivering commercial insights to buyers. And I think, Rather than that, is unveil insights through the questions you ask. To your point, precisely. Yeah, no, absolutely. If you can, if you can show them something that they couldn't see themselves, you're worth your, your weight mm -hmm. in, uh, in consultancy hours. But anyway, um, so the uh, so it's Andy. It's a pleasure as always. So the book again is "Sell Without Selling Out: A Guide to Success on Your Own Terms." Andy Paul, uh, link to the book will be below this video. But before we go, Andy, please update people on what you're doing these days. Sure. Well, we got the the book is coming out. It's taking a lot of time. Got my podcast, Sales Enablement with Andy Paul. We're up to episode ten thousand thirty eight. Um, and um, yeah, reach out to me at, on LinkedIn or 
andypaul.com is is we sort of been uh, off the grid for a couple of years, but now we're coming back with some new consulting services, advisory services to help companies learn how to sell without selling out. Fantastic. Yeah, well, great, great to hear that you're coming back, uh, coming back with the new services, that you're back on the grid after these crazy years. We are. Yes. <laughs> so listen, thanks again, Andy. Thank you for watching and thanks, listening. John. And I'll talk to you all again soon. Bye bye.